Morning. I'd like to start by turning to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 19. There's Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 19. You shall also teach them to your sons, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Let's pray. Dear Lord, just thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you that we all been able to come here and have fellowship with each other, Lord. I just pray that you will bring your word this morning, Lord. I pray that you'll help me speak, Lord, and that you'll help people's hearts receive the word you want them to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. I've recently started trying to read through the Bible slowly with my boys. We get through about two chapters a day, if we're lucky. And we've been slowly working through Deuteronomy. And it was interesting when I came across this verse, it kind of started to hit home to me because we had been reading a lot in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and that before. And there's a lot of emphasis on the law, how the Israelites are to obey the law, how the Levites are to run the temple and all their duties and what the priests are supposed to do and all their things they have to look after and things like that. And the interesting thing was when it came to who is responsible for teaching God's law, it wasn't the duties of the Levites or the priests to teach it to the people. It was the responsibilities of fathers to teach it to their children. And they're supposed to be doing it all the time. And the thing for me that hit home is that fathers are all different kinds of people of all different ages, all different professions, all different education, skills, gifts, all people of different new Christians, old Christians, but God expects all of us to look after the faith of our children. And that means that for us to be able to do that, God's word needs to be accessible to every single person. It's not just for the pastor, not just for the preacher, not just for the evangelist. God's word is for everyone. And in today's world, with so much easy access to information, so much easy access to teachers from all over the world, we can very easily just sit and listen to other people preaching the, the Word of God to us or other people explaining God's Word to us. But how much time do we spend ourselves in God's Word? And don't get me wrong, we are greatly blessed to have access to all the teachers. And God even says in Ephesians 4 that, he gave us teachers specifically to help open the word for us. But God's word is also there for us to delve into. So today, I wanted to look into the importance of us taking our own personal time and spending that time reading God's word and spending time in the Bible for ourselves. So before we start, I thought it would be important to look at how is God's word accessible to all of us? How does God make his word accessible to all of us was as you saw in the opening scriptures God wants fathers to look after the faith of their children and he reiterates that in the New Testament as well so as we see in Ephesians 6 verse 4 fathers do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord so God's expectation is the same throughout all time he expected it in the Old Testament he expects it in the New Testament that we are supposed to bring up our children in the Lord. So how can we as believers of all different levels, of all different faith, of all different parts in our walk, all different just knowledge of the word be able to, able to do that? And to me it's nicely summed up in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6 to 16. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory, just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which has not entered the human heart all that God has prepared for those who love them. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among people knows the thoughts of a person except the spirit of the person that is in him? So also the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, 
so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But the one who spiritually discerns all things, yet he himself is discerned by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So th there's quite a lot to take in there, but to me the interesting thing there is there are two kinds of wisdom. There's the wisdom of the world, or of this age, which is always changing from age to age, and then there's the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is the same as it is today, as it was yesterday and forever more, because God does not change. But as we saw, the natural man does not accept the wisdom of God. And that's because the natural man does not have the spirit of God. But fortunately, when we are saved, as you saw in verse 12, God gives us his spirit. So we see that in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? And we see again in Romans 11 verse, Romans 8 verse 9 to 11. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we see in these verses, when we are saved, God gives us his spirit. And his spirit, God's spirit, can, is the one who searches the depths of God. And in verse 11, the spirit knows the thoughts of God. And God knows everything, and God knows your thoughts. And his spirit is in you, so God's spirit knows our thoughts too. So if the spirit of God is in us and the spirit of God knows us and the spirit of God can open God's word to us, he can also open his word specifically for us. And we see in 1 Peter 1.23 that God's word is a living word, as it says, through the living and enduring word of God. And in Hebrews 4.12 it talks about, for the word of God is living and active. So through the spirit of God, he can make his word alive to you. So as you saw, the natural man does not understand the things of God. But when we read the word of God, God's spirit brings that word alive for us. So you don't need to be a great theologian or mature Christian saved for years. You don't need to be of high education. All you have to do is be saved, be willing to listen to the spirit of God and trust in God. And God will be able to, you can read his word and he'll open it up to you for you at the time you need it, for the reasons you need it and the place you need it. Because the amazing thing I found about God's word over the years is no matter how often you read it and you read the same verse over and over, it can speak to you different things at different times. Its meaning doesn't change, but God can bring it out for you that it means what it needs to for you at that time without, without taking away from its truth. So as we grow, we can grow in God's word. But God will, his word is accessible to anyone who's willing to take the time to read it. And that's why for me it's important. Teachers can open up God's word to us and really help with understanding. But when you take that time and you meditate on it and you read it for yourself, it gives time for God to really talk to you and to open up his word for you. The next important point I believe about reading God's word is it helps us to get to know God. As you see in John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the word, and we get to know him by reading his word as if, because if we know Jesus, we know the Father. For Jesus said in John 8, 19, so they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know, neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would have known my father also. And Jesus and the father are one, as you read in John 10, 30. 
We also read that all scripture is inspired by God. As we read in the beginning of 2 Timothy 3.16. So we can know God the Father by knowing Jesus. And we know Jesus because all scripture is inspired by God. So God let us know who Jesus is. He specifically chose what scriptures to use, what verses to use. He specifically chose how to reveal Jesus to us. Because by knowing Jesus, we know God the Father. And when we read the Bible, we learn about Jesus while being led by the Spirit. So it's God using all of that in one to get to know him. Our Spirit is helping us to understand Jesus. And by, as we understand Jesus, he's our mediator between us and the Father, and we get to know God. So as I say, if we know Jesus, we know the Father. The next important thing... I believe while we should regularly read scripture for ourselves is it helps us become a better Christian. So if we read 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. So to me that's interesting. It's all scripture not just the Old Testament or the New Testament, not certain books or your favorite topics. All scripture is beneficial for us. And to me, you'll be surprised which verses can speak to you. So as I mentioned earlier, I've been reading to my boys, and when you're trying to drudge through the law sometimes, it can feel long, and I'm sitting there, and the boys are like, is this a long one or a short one? How quickly can we get through it? And we just, it almost feels mundane, and we're just trying to get through it. But of having that whole context of really understanding what the priests and the Levites and what their roles were. And then I turn and just read that one verse. And all of that gave the context that even though they had all these amazing duties and they were there to minister to God and to the people. And they were that barrier to make sure that God and the people remained holy. God still expected the people to be the ones to teach the Bible to each other. It was fathers and sons to do it just daily, make it part of their lives. So I wouldn't voluntarily go and probably read those scriptures regularly, but because I was trying to be diligent in that, God was able to speak to me through that and press on my heart something that is important to me. Also importantly, it teaches us how to behave, how to think, how to pray, and how to treat people and how to love people. So God's word is teaching us and sanctifying us to be like Christ. It can also rebuke us if we are not regularly reading God's word, how do we know what's right and wrong? How do we know what we are doing isn't always correct? And when you read God's word, it can really challenge your heart on some of the things you've been doing in your day-to-day -day life. Because not everybody gets to see everything you're doing and not every sermon by a, a preacher or pastor in a church can always hit home for like say a hundred people but when you're reading God's word regularly he can really convict your heart and rebuke you of your sin so you can turn from it also as it says it corrects us it's for correction it's helping us keep on the straight and narrow it's guarding us so we don't go too far off it helps correct our thinking when we hear different things we live in a world with many different views and teachings and philosophies and opinions and God's word is c continuously aligning us to think more like Jesus. And importantly, as I think you touched on, it's our training for righteousness and equipping us for good works. The Bible helps equip us for the work of God. So as we know, the Bible talks about God has things prepared for everything for us. And reading his word is what helps equip us and trains us for those good works he has planned for us. Also, it helps prepare our hearts, which is important. As we see in Matthew 12, 34, you offspring of vipers, how can you being evil express any good things? For the mouth speaks from which, from which fills the heart. And in Luke 6, 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil person out of the evil treasures brings forth evil, for his mouth speak which fills the heart. So it's important that we fill our hearts with the right thing. If we aren't regularly reading our Bible or attending church, we will fill our hearts with the things of this world. If we're only filling our hearts with God's word once a week for an hour, 
and we're filling our hearts with what's out there day to day, because the world bombards us with images and messages and temptations and challenges, what are you filling your heart with? Are you filling it regularly on scripture? Are you filling it with your desires? Are you filling it with your latest political convictions? Are you filling it first with God's word? Because if you fill it with God's word, that will convey what will come out of our mouths. And if we aren't filling it with God's word, then what fills our heart will be that of the world. And that's what will come out of us. So it just helps us in our behavior. Also, as it says in Galatians 5, 16 for 17, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. I've always found that an interesting scripture for me because once you're saved, it's not just always plain sailing. You're given a renewed mind and a renewed spirit, but we still got our fallen bodies which is what we are looking forward to when Jesus comes back, is getting our new bodies. But until then, even as believers, we have this struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And we want to help feed the spirit. We want to walk by the spirit. And the way we know how to walk by the spirit is by taking our time and regularly filling our hearts with God's word. And that will help us. Because as it says again in Galatians, a few verses later in 22 to 23, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So we want to be filled with the Spirit. We want to be filling our hearts with things that bring out the fruit of the Spirit and not of the world. I believe it also helps us to live a more godly life. But regularly reading God's Scripture, it will help guide our path. So as we look in Psalm... 119 verses 9 to 11 how can a young man keep his way pure by keeping it according to your word with all my heart i've sought you do not let me wander from your commandments i've treasured your word in my heart so that i may not sin against you and again in verse 105 your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path as I mentioned before, we live in a world of many temptations and many things to try to draw us away from God. And yet the psalmist is warning that even back then, how does a young man keep his way pure? Was that sometimes the hardest time in life is trying to find your feet, trying to find your path amongst all the temptations. And it's by keeping it according to your word. And you can only know God's word if you spend your time in it. And as again, it says you've treasured it in your heart. So unless we fill our heart with the treasure of God's word and not the treasures of this world, that is what helps us not sin against you. So it's important to help us walk a godly life. Next, it also helps convict us. In Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the word of God is a living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And to me, that's an important one. That, as we said, God's word is a living word, and his spirit is in us. And when you read God's word, it can get to your heart before anything else can. If you aren't filling your the word, your heart with the word of God and with other things, that's going to come out. And how many times have we regretted having said things or done things before it was too late? How many times have we struggled with things in our heart? But God's word can cut through right to our innermost being because only God's word and God knows our thoughts and us. No one else in this room actually knows what goes on in your head. You're able to mediate that, you're able to control that, at times even able to put in a good facade, but you know your mind and you know your heart. And the only other thing that can really cut through that is God's word. And it's important for our health that we spend time in God's word because it can help us work through those struggles in our hearts and minds in a way probably nobody else can. Because as we say, God's spirit knows you, God knows you, and God can really speak to you in his word. Another important thing is the Word of God also teaches us how to treat people. 
And I think that's very important today because we live almost in the time of when everything's been upended. We've got all these restrictions, we've got the pandemic, people are fearful, you've got all these social justice and civil movements rising up, and it all seems to be very angry and aggressive, and it's all about being against people. But God wants us to, God wants to save people, so it's very important that we know how to treat people, it's very important we know how to treat each other as believers when we have disagreements or we have differences, and it's also important to know how to treat the unsaved. I find a good reminder of having, how to treat people is Colossians 3, verses 8 to 17. But now you must put away all anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which has been renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Yeah, there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so that you also must forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let not the peace of Christ rule and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Always find in those few verses, it's a very good reminder to remember to treat each other with loving kindness, respect, gentleness, showing humility, being humble and forgiving. It can be very hard doing that sometimes. And if we aren't reminded how to do that, we can sometimes let our flesh get hold of us instead of the spirit. And at the difficult times, we should be one body supporting each other. To me, it's pointless if we know all the deepest theology and ologies and doctrines, but if we don't live the doctrine of how we're supposed to walk as Christian, how we're supposed to treat each other. As it says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Truth without love makes the truth ununderstandable to those you're trying to speak to. Truth without love makes it sound ugly and harmful and not something you want to listen to and will probably make it harder for someone else to speak their truth in the future. It's very important how we speak the truth. Now, there's one famous commentator who likes to say facts don't care about your feelings, but God does. God cares about who you are as a person. He knows that the lost are lost, that they are resistant to his word, that they are under the control of the devil and that he's trying to do everything to keep them away from him. So how we bring across the truth is very important. It's not, as believers, we aren't just about winning arguments. We're about saving souls of the lost. So we can't just be about the head knowledge, but have no heart knowledge of how God says we must treat each other. But if we only care about our heart, but we don't know the word of God, and we don't know his truth, because it says the truth will set you free, and Jesus is the truth, how are you supposed to actually save people if you can't give them the proper truth? If you treat them nice and treat people nicely, but you don't come with the truth, you can't set them free. And if you come with the truth in the wrong way, you will still you'll bind them even harder to this world. So we need both. We need the truth of God's word to take those difficult truths to the world, but we need to do it in the right way. And when we read God's word, it tells us continuously how to treat people. And it's with love, kindness, respect, long-suffering, and patience. But we always tell the God's truth so that we can save people. The next reason is God expects us to be able to give a reason for the hope that is in us. As you read in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you 
to give an account for the hope is that in you, but with gentleness and respect. So as I mentioned before, we, we live in a lot of, in a world with lots of beliefs and changing views, and you always got some new thing coming on the horizon. But God doesn't always tell us to, we don't have to know every single possible flavor of what's happening. We are blessed to have many good teachers who can help unpack that for us and do good works in those areas. But at the very least, each believer should be able to at least give a defense of their faith, give a defense of why they believe in Jesus, why they believed in the gospel and their hope. And as we read, God's word prepares us for our works of righteousness. It prepares us for the good works he has for us. So unless we know God's word, unless we mature and grow and move from milk to meat, we won't really be able to give a really good defense of the word. So another reason to regularly read our word is to just continuously to get to know God's word, know what it means, know why we believe what we believe, not just what we believe. I think another important thing why I must read the Bible is it will help us spot any fakes or false preachers or any forgeries of the gospel. Because as we see in God's word, we're warned quite a lot about false teachers. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3 verse 15, for such men are false prophets, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Colossians 2, 8, See to it that there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according accordance with human tradition in accordance with the elementary principles of this world rather than in accordance with Christ. 2 Peter 2, 1, But false prophets also appearing among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the master who brought them, bought them, bring swift destruction upon themselves. Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly ravenous wolves. 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4, For this time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn us out to myth. And 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether you are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. When I was researching this, I found it so interesting. That's six different warnings in six different books of the New Testament. And when I was just looking at this, there's actually more warnings. The Bible continuously warns us that there's the struggles. It says, for our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We're in the battle where we are trying to save people, we're trying to bring people to God, but we're in a battle where Satan wants to take as many people away from that as possible to try hinder the church and slow us down. So we need to be able to prepare and be able to see who are of God and who are of not God. Because even like it says, Satan comes as an angel of light. It's not always obvious. So I like the analogy of how people spot forgeries when it comes to art or money. They don't learn about what's the, what's the latest forgery, what's the latest forging technique, what's the latest way to copy things. What they do is they study the original so well that you can just naturally and easily find any inconsistencies when it comes to, say, fake money, fake notes or something. They know the original so well, that's how you can spot the fake. That's how you can spot the forgery. It's not that you spend so much time learning about the forgeries. And that's what regularly reading God's word helps us, is it's filling our hearts with God's word. It's helping us understand and know God's word so that if someone comes along preaching God's word, you'll be able to see and discern who they are. So just like the Bereans did in Acts 17, 11, now these people were noble-minded than those in Thessalon Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were true. So to me, there's two things there. A lot of times people always just focus on they examined the scriptures to see if it was true. But before that, they received it with eagerness. They were always happy to have someone come in. They were happy to have Paul come and preach. And they received God's word with eagerness. But they always went back to the Bible to make sure what was being said is true. And we should be doing that ourselves for everyone. 
And also finally, for me, it's important we read God's word regularly because once a week is not good enough. Coming to church just on a Sunday and then going back into the world for six, seven days, only having received and God's word, having been just cleansed that one week, having our souls refreshed for that hour on Sunday is not going to get us through the whole week. One sermon a week can't f cover all the battles you're going to face ahead. And one sermon a week can't cover everyone's struggles all at once in the church. We need to have a continual renewing of our mind. As you read in Romans 12 too, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove that the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. God's word is what helps renew our mind daily. Spending time in God's word really helps us prepare for those days ahead, those weeks ahead. As you read earlier, God's spirit is in you and God knows what you need. So when you read his word, it can really speak to you personally. As I said, it helps with your relationship with God. It helps with you knowing God and it helps prepare you regularly throughout the week. Also, I find it's important that we read God's word for ourselves because as we read in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 14, now I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no division among you, but that you have made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brothers and sisters, by Chloe's people, that there were quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you saying, I am with Paul, I am with Apollos, I am with Cephas, I am with Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or, was, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? It's very interesting that because we are so accessible, we all have our favorite teachers, and then we can get into a situation where it says, John says this, Peter says this, Daniel says this. But uh, we should be focusing on Jesus first. So as I said, while we are greatly blessed to have great teachers, our focus shouldn't purely be on who's our favorite teacher. If we're spending time in God's word, our focus is always on Jesus, and those teachers can help open the word to us, they can help us grow, but we don't want to be in a position where it's John versus Joe, Peter versus Paul. We want to be aligned with Christ, we want to be one body in one mind, and focusing on Jesus first means we don't get into a position of where we are about who, which person do we follow, but we should be following God first. So yes, while we are very fortunate to have many great teachers, I think re personally reading God's word is important for us. I know it can be difficult at times. We're in a busy world, busy life, on the train, in the car, and it's very easy to just always put on the podcast, to always just listen to YouTube in the background or do something. But I think it's important that we always carve out time to personally read God's word for ourselves too so it can speak to us. So in summary, it's important to read God's word and we should take a time as God's word is accessible to us. He has put his spirit in us so that we can understand God's word no matter who we are. The world might find a foolishness, but God, when he saved us, gave us an helper and we're not alone in understanding God's word. Reading God's word is how we get to know him. It's how he has personally chosen to reveal himself to us. It's how we can learn what to pray and how to know God's will. It helps to make us better Christians by teaching us and preparing us for the good works God has, by helping us live a more godly life, by correcting and rebuking us, by convicting us when we are not in God's will and are in sin. It teaches us how to behave and how to love one another and how to treat the lost. It equips us to give the reason for the hope that is in us. It allows us to not be taken by every wind of doctrine and every teaching out there of every new challenge. It helps us give us faith and stability in Jesus. It strengthens us each day as we go out into the world. It renews our mind and it keeps our focus on Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this day, Lord. I just pray that your word will go out, Lord. I thank you that you put this on my heart today, Lord, and I pray that it will help reach the hearts of those who need to hear it, Lord. I pray 
that what's of you is settled in people's hearts and what is not of you, Lord, that you will allow to wash over them, Lord. I just pray as everyone gets ready to go out in the week ahead, Lord, that you will renew, renew their minds, refresh their spirits, Lord, and refresh their souls so we can go out and be a light in this world where everyone is in darkness and confusion, Lord. I just pray that you will bless us as a fellowship, Lord, and that you will help us grow stronger in unity, Lord, and that we will have love for one another first and that we'll be guarded by the mind of Christ and the love of Jesus in all that we do, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.